Okay, so welcome to the first lecture from uh, uh, from um, selected topics in, in graph theory. I am very happy to see you all here. Uh, today we'll be uh, we'll be talking about matchings in graphs uh, and uh, give you basic results about uh, matchings in bipartite graphs and matchings in general. Uh, so just to be on the same page, I hope that many of you have seen a basics of this theory uh, already on some courses before, uh, like discrete maths. Uh, however, this will be a little bit deep. So a matching in a graph is simply a set of edges uh, that pairwise do not share endpoints. So for instance, if you have this graph here, right, a matching could look like that. Maybe I will pick this edge. Maybe I will pick this edge in the graph. Um, maybe, and maybe this edge, right? So these are three edges. That do not uh, that pairwise do not share uh, endpoints, and this is a matching. So a matching in a graph is 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 maximum if it's of largest possible cardinality. So for instance, this matching here, this red uh, red matching here, is uh, is maximum because you could uh, you can easily see that you will not have uh, even though the the graph has eight uh, vertices. So theoretically, maybe there would be a matching consisting of four edges. You can see that these three vertices cannot be matched. Uh, uh, fully to those two because these are the only neighbors of, of those three vertices and therefore there does not exist a perfect matching, a matching that uh, matches every vertex and therefore this matching of size uh, three in this graph is actually maximum, which means of largest possible cardinal. And perfect matchings are matchings that uh, uh, match every vertex uh, or uh, equivalently these are matchings of cardinality exactly half of the vertex. Right. So the goal of this lecture is to uh, describe the structure, the combinatorial structure be uh, behind maximum matchings in bipartite graphs and in general graphs. In bipartite graphs, this is given by Hall's theorem, which probably you have seen already uh, before, um, but we will uh, reprove it uh, um, in a moment. Uh, in general graphs, this is given by uh, Tutt's theorem or uh, tutt Birch formula, uh, which we'll prove in the later stages of this lecture. Good. Uh, so the basic tool, the most basic tool uh, that, uh, that one uses when talking about uh, matchings and uh, how matchings behave in, in graphs is uh, our alternating paths and augmenting paths. Uh, so an alternate, if, if I've got a matching M in a graph, um, a, a path P is uh, is alternating if it alternately uh, alternately uses uh, edges from from the matching and outside of the match. Yeah. So for instance, uh, here is an alternating path. Yes, and it starts, for instance, with an uh, edge that uh, doesn't lie in the matching. Then it uses an edge from the matching, doesn't uh, uh, uses an edge outside of the matching, an edge from the matching, and so on and so on. Right. And an alternating path is, is called augmenting if the first vertex and the last vertex of this path are unmatched by the matching M. So they are free to, uh, to graphs uh, for, for, uh, for the purpose of, uh, of extending the matching. Right? And there is a, a very simple lemma uh, that if I have a maximum matching, a matching that cannot be made larger, then actually you cannot see any augmenting path for this matching. Yeah? Why so? Well, because if there was an augmenting path, then actually I could uh, use this path to make the matching larger. I could simply um, augment this matching by selling all these edges from the matching on the path and adding all the remaining edges. So like switching uh, the matching along the path, right? And this is fine because the first vertex and the last vertex were unmatched in, in, in my matching, which means that uh, I still have uh, still have the property that uh, that edges of the matching uh, have pairwise different endpoints. Yeah? And by switching this, uh, I uh, augment the size of the matching by one. Right. So this is uh, the proof of this lesson. Right. So the uh, search for alternating paths and uh, augmenting paths in particular is a basic tool for extending matchings and therefore for um, for analyzing the structure of maximum match. Right, so the main uh, question that, uh, uh, that one can uh, ask about say bipartite graphs or uh, general graphs uh, later on is about uh, when does a bipartite graph have a perfect match? Yeah, so when uh, can I have a, a matching that matches every vertex? 
And uh, before asking uh, uh, when does it have a perfect matching, uh, we may ask when does it not have a perfect matching. In, in other words, how can we find a witness, a sort of a reason um, using which we can ensure that uh, there is no perfect matching in the graph. And this reason we essentially have already seen on this picture, right? Here we had three vertices that in total were seeing only two other vertices. And we argued that uh, these three vertices cannot be, uh, cannot be matched uh, completely uh, in any match. So for a set of vertices S, let me define the defect of, uh, of the set of vertices as the, uh, as the difference between the number of vertices of S and the total number of neighbors of S, right? So this is a difference and observe that the defect is positive if, the, um, if and only if the number of neighbors is strictly smaller than the number of vertices. And then, of course, if the defect of uh, if, if the defect of any uh, of any set uh, a subset of the left side uh, is positive, then definitely we cannot have a uh, a perfect matching or even any matching that matches every vertex of A. Why? Because if I had, for instance, a set S here with four vertices and the neighborhood of S only consisted, say, of two vertices, then in any matching, these four vertices can be matched only to those two. So two of them must be left. Uh, definitely unmatched, right? Uh, so uh, this means, or in, in other words, uh, if I have the, the defect is positive, then at least this number defect of S vertices of S uh, cannot be matched in any matching uh, that, that one can find in the graph, right? So definitely if the defect is positive, there is no uh, perfect matching and also no matching that saturates A. That uh, and such rates A means that every vertex of A is uh, um, is matched, uh, and there is Hall's theorem that uh, tells that uh, quite surprisingly a bit that this is a uh, not only a necessary condition for ex the existence of a matching that saturates A, but actually also a sufficient condition. So Hall's theorem says that a bipartite graph has a uh, has a matching that saturates the left side, that saturates the the side A, if and only if the defect of every uh, subset of A is uh, is, is non-positive. So in other words, this means that for every set S, for every subset of the left side, uh, the number of neighbors of the set S is at least as large as the size of this set, right? Uh, right, so now let's prove this theorem. I hope that many of you have already seen the proof of this theorem on some discrete mass course, but let's go through it, uh, through it again. So one implication is trivial. The uh, top to bottom implication is trivial. We have already seen it uh, uh, in the lemma above. Uh, if we have a set of uh, positive defects, then definitely uh, some element of this uh, set cannot be matched. Yeah, so now we are left with the uh, top uh, bottom to top implication. So an implication where we want to uh, show that if the defect of every set is non-positive, then actually we can find a, a matching that saturates A. Right, so how do we do it? Let's uh, take a matching that, uh, that is maximal. Yeah, so this, uh, we know from the, from, the, from, the, from the claim that this should be a matching that saturates, that uh, matches every vertex of A, but suppose that this is not the case. Suppose this matching uh, uh, um, leaves some set of vertices S1, which is non-empty. Here is S1, which is non-empty, yeah? That these vertices are actually uh, unmatched by this matching M, yeah? Okay, so what, uh, what can we see on this picture? Let's see the neighbors of this uh, set S1, yeah? So here is the set T1 consisting of the neighbors of S1, right? So these are vertices that, uh, all the vertices that, uh, that are adjacent to any of the vertices of S1. Yeah. Here it is, S1. Right, so definitely we know that all these vertices here, they need to be matched by the matching M. Why? Because if any of these vertices was unmatched, then actually it has a neighbor in S1, and this edge between this neighbor and this vertex in question could be added to, uh, to the matching, right? So this means that all the, all the vertices of, uh, of T1 must be matched, yeah? 
So I can draw in red uh, the, the matching edges, the edges that, uh, that match vertices of, of T1. And here are some new vertices that are the matches of, of T1. Yeah. So let's uh, incorporate them to, uh, to S and let this be S2. S2 is S1 plus all the matches of T1. Okay, so now let's look at S2 and uh, let's uh, try to apply this again. Um, ah, yeah, obviously S1 by our assumption, uh, by our assumption that the, the defect of every set is, is, is non-positive, um, the size of T1 is at least the size of S1, right? Because T1 was the neighborhood of S1. Uh, good, so in particular, uh, T1 is exactly the size of S2. Uh, sorry, uh, the size of S2 minus S1. Um, right, so now we've got S1, uh, S2, which is S1 plus the, the matches. Yeah? And these vertices also have some neighborhood. And this neighborhood uh, definitely needs to contain some new vertices, right? Because this neighborhood must be of size, at least the size of S2. Yes. However, the size of this part of S2 was the same as the, as the size uh, of, the, of the previous neighbor. Yeah. So here I have at least as many new neighbors of S2 yeah, compared to S1 as the size of S1. S1 was non-empty. Non, non so I ha here have some new neighbor. Yeah. So here this is T2, which is the neighborhood of S2. Right. So here I've got some new neighbors. And again, I can play the same game. Um, imagine that one of those guys was actually unmatched by the, uh, by the uh, matching M. Then what happens? This guy has a neighbor in here. Yeah, because, well, uh, this was by, by definition. We just expanded the, the set. Then this neighbor is matched by some edge of the matching to somebody from T1. And somebody from T1 actually had a neighbor via an unmatched, uh, unmatched edge yes, in, in S1. And now here you see an augmenting path yeah? that starts in one vertex that was unmatched and in another vertex that was, was unmatched yes? and alternately uses mm, edges from, from the matching and from outside of the matching. So this would be a contradiction because we could use then this uh, augmenting uh, uh, path in order to uh, improve the size of the matching, right? So this means that all these vertices here, yes, are actually matched by our matching and we can extend S2 to another set S3 and we can play this game again, right? So now we, we create S3, which are S2 plus the matches of uh, the vertices matched to, uh, to T2. And uh, we see that S3 must have, again, some new vertices in the neighborhood, T3, and so on and so on. And again, T3, they need to be again matched because otherwise I would see an uh, augmenting path uh, of, length, uh, of length five and so on. So this procedure could essentially uh, work forever, meaning every time I'm, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm uh, allowed to, um, to construct the next set S3, the next set T3, S4, T4, and so on and so on, every time um, making a progress. However, the graph is finite. This is, the, this is, a, um, this is a condition that, uh, that we will be using throughout this whole course. We'll be only working on finite graphs. So this procedure must stop at some point, yes? And it can only stop when it reaches an unmatched vertex on this side, and in which case we, we just discovered an augmenting path, yeah? And this is a contradiction with the assumption that uh, M was maximum, and this finishes the proof. Good, so this was the proof of Hall's theorem. Uh, before we continue, maybe we will make this uh, exercise that I will be uh, doing uh, quite often uh, during those lectures. Uh, namely, if you are on the same page and uh, you're happy with this proof, please put a plus one in the chat so that I see that uh, I did not lose you. Uh, 
Okay, great. I see a wave of plus ones. I hope that you have already seen this proof of false theorem before or some uh, equivalent proof of false theorem before. So we, we continue. Okay, so um, this was uh, about uh, host theorem is about uh, how, uh, what is the sufficient and necessary condition uh, for uh, the existence of a matching that saturates A. However, uh, what if we care about uh, situations where I cannot really saturate A, um, but I care about how many, uh, what is the minimum possible number of elements of A that I cannot match? Yeah, so I would like to uh, find a matching that is simply maximum possible and uh, understand in terms of the defect how many uh, guys I can, uh, how many, how, how large matching like that I can find. Yeah. So let's make some definitions. The uh, maximum matching uh, number of a graph is just the size of the maximum matching. And the defect of a graph is simply the maximum size uh, of a um, defect uh, uh, of a subset of A. Right? Um, so then, uh, not surprisingly, you can use uh, Hall's uh, theorem to uh, to prove the following theorem, which is sometimes is called the OS uh, formula, and uh, this uh, this tells you that uh, the size of the maximum matching that you can find in a graph is exactly the size of the left side, the side A minus the defect. Right. So you can also uh, think of this uh, statement as the minimum possible possible number of unmatched unmatched in A is exactly the defect of G. Yeah, so the maximum possible defect of a subset of the, of the right side, right? Because this, uh, this, uh, this amount is exactly uh, the number of unmatched vertices from A. Sorry, the number of matched vertices in, in A. Right, uh, so um, for the proof, actually one implication is very simple. If I have uh, a set A, that, uh, a set S that uh, simply witnesses this, uh, this uh, defect. So this is a, a set of maximum defect size, of, of maximum defect. Um, then we already argued that uh, how many vertices of this S cannot be matched. Well, uh, the defect uh, tells us, yes, that this, at least this many elements of, of this set S uh, must be left unmatched. Right, so if uh, this number elements can be, uh, which is equal to the defect of G, uh, cannot be matched, uh, then the size of the maximum matching cannot be larger uh, than A minus this number of vertices unmatched. Yeah, so uh, we are left with the second inequality, the, um, which essentially, uh, which, which, uh, which says that there is always, there is always a matching of size at least size of a minus the defect yeah this is the other uh, inequality yeah so uh, yeah to just not write this defect all the time let k be the number of, uh, be the size of the defect and uh, this argument will be actually an easy padding argument uh, uh, and we will just use calls theorem as a black box um, so here is a here is b and what i do i simply add here to b k new vertices And these are universal vertices in the sense that all of them see all of the, uh, the vertices of A, right? So they are universal to A. So this means that, uh, well, if the defect before was, uh, maximum defect was before equal to K, now every set of vertices here, yes, actually uh, sees K new vertices, right? So the defect, Yes, the defect being the, the size of the set minus the, uh, the, the number of neighbors, because the number of neighbors now grew by K, the defect drops by K, right? So by adding this K universal vertices, I achieve the situation where the, uh, all the defects uh, after, the, after this addition of this K universal vertices are non-positive. Yeah, I drag them all down uh, to a non-positive value. So now I can use Hall's theorem because I know that now the defects are non-positive to say that there is a matching here that saturates the side A. Yeah, everybody in A is is uh, is uh, is matched. Yeah. So now uh, what we can just do? We can just uh, remove those fake vertices that we added. Yes, 
And to remove all of those fake vertices also removes all the edges from the matching that there were incident to them. But uh, what we are left with is a matching of size at least a minus k, the size of a minus k, because well, only k edges of the matching uh, could be could be dropped in. Good. So this is uh, Ores formula, and uh, and this tells us exactly uh, how many uh, vertices we can match in, in a bipod. Good. So now we are uh, moving to something probably new uh, to many of you, namely uh, matchings in general. Yeah. So we are going to try to uh, uh, to develop a similar theory um, that explains how many vertices can be matched uh, at, at maximum uh, in a general group. And this theory is a bit uh, more complicated uh, because uh, actually in bipartite graphs, uh, we were using the fact that uh, we, we have two sides. Uh, it was uh, not trivial that uh, we were jumping from left to right, uh, for example, in the proof of, of course theory. Uh, but in general graphs, uh, we are going to, uh, to also uh, find a sufficient and, uh, and necessary condition for the existence of a perfect matching. Uh, and for this, we will need uh, to actually state this condition. So we need to have an analog of this uh, defect that we have. So now we are thinking about what is the witness that a graph um, doesn't contain a perfect match, doesn't contain a matching that matches every part. Uh, so this uh, definition will be a little bit uh, strange at first glance, but then it will uh, turn that it is actually a very good definition. Uh, if I have a graph and I have a set, uh, subset of vertices, the deficit of the subset of vertices uh, written like that in df uh, of s is, is the following. Let me look at s and let me look at the graph after the removal of s. So this graph uh, dissolves into into, into several connected components. Right, and then I uh, look at those connected components. Some of them uh, can be even, yeah? So maybe these are even connected components. And by even, I mean of even size, of even number of vertices. And the remaining components, of course, are odd. Yeah, so I partition the, the components into even and odd. And the deficit of a set S is the difference between the number of odd components and the size of S. Okay, this is a bit weird. Yeah. Uh, the deficit of the whole graph is uh, similar to what we had before, the maximum possible deficit of, uh, of a subset of vertices. Um, and now the, the following lemma explains why this, uh, why this, uh, um, why this, uh, definition is actually good for us. Uh, I claim that uh, every matching in G uh, must leave at least the deficit of G uh, vertices unmatched. So the deficit of a graph is a lower bound on how many vertices uh, must be left unmatched in any match. Yeah? And the proof is as follows. So suppose I've got here the set S, uh, and this uh, set S is the set that, uh, uh, that has the maximum possible deficit. Yeah. Um, and here I've got the odd components and here I've got the even components. So how, am, uh, how a matching in, in the graph can look like? Well, if there are only three, three vertices here and there are say five uh, odd components, then the matching uh, can match those, uh, um, those vertices here to, to some components. Uh, maybe they, they will match be between themselves, maybe they will be matched to, to even components. But at the worst case, uh, if there are, say, three vertices here and five vertices there, only three of the odd components can be, uh, can be matched uh, to the vertices of S. And all the remaining odd components, these two, yeah, they, will, uh, they will contain an odd number of vertices and they cannot be matched to anything else because these are different connected components and the, uh, the vertices of S are already taken, right? So the maximum matching in those components can only take some edges here yeah, but because these components are of odd size, they, there must be, just from the parity reasons, at least one vertex here unmatched. Yeah, in each of those uh, components that are, that are not matched to S. 
right? So all these components must contain an unmatched ver uh, vertex, uh, and there is at least the deficit of them, where the deficit is the difference between those, those odd components and the size of this. Right. And uh, then we have the Tadverge formula. The Tadverge formula says that this uh, lower bound is actually tight. Um, so I think that uh, it is uh, easier to grasp Tadverge formula in this form. And this form tells you that uh, this on the, on the right hand side, we've got the vertex count minus twice the size of the maximum matching, which is exactly the minimum number of vertices unmatched. Right, so um, if I've got a maximum matching, uh, if I subtract twice the size of the maximum matching from the vertex count, I get the number of vertices unmatched, yes? And here, uh, this is of course the, uh, the maximum deficit. Yeah, so this formula tells you that the maximum deficit uh, is exactly the minimum possible number of vertices that you can leave unmatched, yeah? And if you do the maths, uh, uh, put the different uh, um, pieces on different sides, you've got the, the original phrasing of the Todd formula, which tells you the size of the maximum matching is uh, N minus the, the deficit of this, right? Um, yeah, so uh, we are going now to prove this uh, this the uh, this Burge formula. It will take us some time because it's a, it's a uh, quite a non-trivial um, theorem actually. One of the uh, one of the inequalities of, uh, of of this equality is actually already very very simple. We already did this in this uh, in this lemma. Yeah, we argued that uh, every matching uh, must leave at least this number of vertices unmatched. Right. So we know. Um, by this, that uh, that uh, I cannot find a matching that is larger uh, than this expression here, right? Uh, so we are left with uh, with the other uh, with the other inequality to prove. Yes. So what we actually need to do, given a graph, uh, we need to construct a matching M that has only that many uh, vertices on the match. Yeah. That has only the deficit of G uh, vertices. Good. So this we will uh, um, be spending the, the next, say, 20 minutes on. Uh, but before we continue, uh, are there any questions uh, now uh, to that Burge formula or ORES formula? Or if not, then please put a plus one in the chat. Okay, I see a wave of plus one, so I'm happy that you are on board. Um, so let's uh, go to the, uh, to the proof. And uh, before we actually do the proof itself, uh, we will make uh, uh, several observations that will be useful uh, for the proof. Good. The first observation is, is kind of funny and uh, seem a, a little bit uh, odd at, some po at, at this point. I claim that actually all the deficits of all the sets of vertices have the same parity. And more precisely, uh, for every subset of a, a subset A of vertices, the deficit of A is actually have the same parity as the size of the vertex, uh, as, the, as the vertex count uh, of the group, right? So of course, if they all have the same parity as N, they all have the same parity between each other. Uh, and the proof is actually really simple. You just need to realize that this is true. Uh, so what is deficit of A? By, um, by, by definition, this is the number of odd components of G minus A minus A. So this modulo two minus the size of A, this modulo two, the number of uh, odd connected components is the same as if I was uh, just uh, summing through all the components, the number of vertices, right? Because every odd component modulo two contributes with a one and every uh, even component modulo two contributes with a zero. Uh, now, if I just sum the size of the components, this is the same as just taking the, 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 the total number of vertices uh, that are outside of A. Yeah? So this is the size of uh, V of G minus A, minus A. Now, minus and plus are the same modulo 2. So we've got this. Yeah? And uh, the, in, in total, we've got N, the number of vertices. Right. So we, we, we have just concluded that all the deficits have the same parity. Uh, so this will be helpful at some point later. 
Good, but the main bulk of the proof will be about, uh, um, will be about uh, uh, analyzing the structure around the following set of verbs. So this is a definition that, uh, that will be with us uh, for the next uh, few minutes. Uh, let S be the maximum size set of maximum deficit. So I'm looking at all the subsets of vertices. I'm taking the one that has the maximum possible deficit. Yeah, this uh, DF of S, which is the number of odd components minus uh, the size of S. And among those, I take the one that has the maximum possible size. Yeah, and I would like to understand the properties of the set uh, and uh, ultimately understand the structure of how the graph revolves around the set. So the first observation is that uh, if I look at S and I look at uh, all the components of G minus S and actually all of them must be off. I cannot have even components. So suppose otherwise, suppose that the, here is a, uh, a component that is, that is odd. Component C that is, uh, sorry, uh, that is even. Yeah, that has an even number of vertices. And let, uh, let me take you uh, any vertex of this component. Yeah. Uh, so now observe what would happen if I took another set S prime, which is S with the, set, with the vertex U uh, added. So this is S prime. Um, so what happens? Um, this, uh, this even component uh, then got partitioned, uh, got uh, dissolved, uh, broken into several further components. Yeah? It was even before yeah? I removed one vertex. Yeah? So uh, apart from this vertex, the total number of vertices in those components must be odd. And therefore, at least one of them must be odd. right? So in total, we have extended the size of S by one. The size of S prime is the size of S plus one. Yeah? Um, and also um, by, uh, by, rem by adding U to, to S, we uh, made at least one more odd component of, uh, of, of G minus S prime. So in other words, G minus S prime has more odd connected components than G minus S because we, uh, at, we, we gained at least one here. Right. So this means um, that, well, the size of S grew by one, but the number of odd components grew by at least one, which means that the deficit of S prime must be at least the deficit of S. Yeah, because both sides of the subtraction uh, grew by one and one uh, could grow uh, even more. Yeah. So this means that S prime is strictly larger than S and has no smaller deficit. Yeah, and this is a contradiction with our choice of S. Right, so this is the proof of this observation. Okay, so this was the proof of, of this observation. The third observation actually says threatening of this observation uh, and the proof will be, will be kind of similar. And this observation, observation number three is actually the key point in the proof. So, 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 so please hold on. Um, I claim the following. Here is the set S. And let me uh, look at any connected component C of G minus S. Yeah? So this is this component C. And let me take any vertex U from there. Yeah? So this is the vertex U. And here I have this, uh, this, uh, this component C minus U. Yeah? This, uh, this might be this connected graph. Yeah? It's just a... a uh, component C with the vertex U uh, removed. I claim that the deficit in this graph is actually zero. In other words, this means that uh, in this graph, graph, um, whenever I have a, a set of vertices, yes, and I remove the set of vertices, uh, and I count the number of connected odd connected components that I get. This number of odd connected components is at least uh, is at most as large as the size of the set I removed. Yeah, maybe I will not write it, um, but uh, this means that uh, in our condition on in, in the Tad Burge formula, we've got actually tightness. Uh, we will not have uh, um, here uh, counter examples to the existence of a perfect metric. Good, so this is observation number three, and so let's prove it. Um, okay, so suppose, uh, suppose otherwise, yeah, by contradiction. Suppose actually here in C minus A, C minus U, 
we've got some subset of vertices, yeah, T, yeah, such that uh, after removal of T, if I break this graph into connected components like that, I get more odd components than the size of T. Uh, so we, we play the same game. We define a new set S prime and we try to argue that actually it would be a better S. And our new S prime is, uh, as you probably uh, should guess, is S plus the vertex U plus the set T. So this is S prime. Yeah. So let's look where are the components of G minus S prime. Yeah, so let's look at G minus S prime and what are the components? Where well, the components are the old components. Yeah, apart from the component C that just got broken. Yeah? Plus uh, we've got also those components. These are actually the components of C minus, uh, C minus U minus T. Yeah, so these are components of G minus U minus T. Uh, sorry, my, uh, and minus S as well. Yeah. Uh, not really of, uh, I'm sorry for this, of C minus U minus T. Now it, it should be okay. Yeah. And uh, we suppose that uh, T is actually a counterexample. Uh, so this means that C minus U minus T has more than the size of T odd components. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, analyze this set as prime. Yeah. So first of all, what is the size of S prime? Well, Obviously, it is the size of S plus the size of T that we added, plus one for the vertex U. Yeah. And how many odd components do we, did we get in total? Well, we've got all the odd components that we had before. Yes, minus one because uh, C uh, got dissolved into several more. And then uh, uh, from this uh, C minus U minus T, we got more than T odd connected components. Yes, so we got at least T plus one new uh, uh, odd, odd components. Yeah, so the odd, um, the number of odd components of G minus S is uh, the number of odd components of G minus, uh, sorry, of G minus S prime is at least the number of odd components of G minus S plus the size of T. Right. Uh, so what is the, the deficit of uh, S prime compared to the deficit of S? Well, uh, by definition, this is the, the, the difference between the odd components and the, the number of odd components and the, the size of S prime. Yeah. Uh, so by these inequalities, you see that here we added T yes, to the number of uh, odd components at least, and here to the size of S prime, we added T plus one. Yeah? So if you uh, like added, subtract uh, uh, T to this equation, so you see here uh, that you've got the number of odd components of G minus S minus the, the, size of, uh, the, the size of S, but you've got also this training minus one, which resolves to the deficit of S minus one. So that's not exactly perfect because we just argued that uh, the deficit of S prime may have dropped by one. Yeah. So in before in the in the previous uh, observation we we argued that it uh, it needs to be as, at least as large while S prime is strictly larger than S and this is a contradiction. But now here the deficit might have dropped by one. But now a magic trick, we got this observation that the deficits actually have always the same parity. So it could not have dropped by just one because then the parity would have changed. Yeah? So this parity trick tells us that actually the deficit of the new uh, S prime must be at least as large as the deficit of S, right? Uh, so we are done, yeah? Because the deficit did not drop, the set S prime actually um, got strictly larger. Uh, and this is again a contradiction with the definition of S as the maximum size set of maximum deficit. So this was the proof of observation three, and this is the key observation in the, uh, in the proof. Um, yes, so uh, maybe some plus ones uh, to make sure, because this was a little bit more complicated. Or questions, of course. Uh, you can always ask a question, interrupt and ask. Can you repeat very quickly just uh, like the inequality that we showed? Um, uh, this one? Yes. Um, you mean oh, well, uh, the, 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 the orange one, the orange one. Yeah, the orange one, good. Uh, right. 
So let's look at the deficit of S prime. Yeah, the deficit of S prime is the difference uh, of two terms: the number of odd components of uh, G minus S prime and the size of S prime. Yeah. So what is the size of S prime? The size of S prime is size of S plus T plus one. Yeah. So uh, compared to S, this uh, this number grew by T plus one. Yeah. What is the number of odd components of G minus S prime? Well, it is at least the number of odd components we had before, minus one because we lost the component C, but we gained at least T plus one new components because T was supposed to be a counterexample to our claim. Yeah. Now you see that T cancels out here. Yeah. One actually also cancels out. Yeah. And you've got the number of odd components you had before minus the size of S. Yeah. But you also have this minus one. Actually, this minus one came from the uh, from the loss of component uh, of component C. Yeah. So you get uh, at the end that the uh, the deficit of the new set is at least the deficit of the old set minus one. But but because of parity, it could not have dropped by exactly one. Is it now clear? Okay, any more questions? This is a tricky part of the proof. Good, then if not, then let's continue with the proof uh, and towards observation four. Um, so, so far we understood more or less how the components of G minus S look like. Yeah, we uh, recall S is this uh, maximum size of maximum deficit. Uh, we know that all of those components here are odd and all have the strong property that after removal of any vertex, the, the deficit is actually already zero. Yeah. So now we proceed to understand the interaction between S yes, and between those components. And you can uh, think about this interaction a bit more abstractly via this, uh, let's say, bipartite uh, uh, incidence graph. Yeah. So I create a graph which, on one side, have the set, uh, has the set S. On the other hand, uh, it has the connected components of G minus S. And I just uh, say that uh, a vertex is uh, adjacent to a component in in this bipartite graph if and only if uh, there was a uh, um, there was a neighbor in this component. Yeah. So here, a vertex is adjacent. Um, to this component if it had a neighbor in this component. Yeah, so in other words, you can think about it as contracting at each of those con connected components um, to a single vertex and also clearing out the edges inside S. I do not care about it. So this, uh, this is now a bipartite graph. Uh, okay, so let's try to understand the structure of this bipartite graph. And I claim that from the maximality of, uh, of S, I can argue the following observation, that this bipartite graph actually has a matching that saturates the side S. Yeah? So I can find here a matching. Uh, actually, maybe here uh, I should have one more vertex. I, have, I should have here a matching where every vertex of S is matched. Yeah? So how do we prove it? Well, we already have Hall's uh, um, theorem. So in order to certify that uh, uh, a matching like that exists, we need to check that Hall's condition in this graph H um, holds. So in other words, we need to check that uh, we need to arrive at a contradiction um, uh, from the following supposition, that there exists a subset of vertices here, a subset of vertices uh, X. Oh, uh, I have a picture uh, drawn here. A subset of vertices uh, X here that in total sees less connected components, yes, uh, than its size, yeah? Because if we prove that uh, this is not the case, that uh, actually every set of vertices inside S sees at, at least as many components uh, as its size, then by Hall's uh, theorem, we see here a, a matching that saturates uh, S. Good, so suppose otherwise, suppose that, uh, that indeed uh, such, a, such X exists, uh, as on the picture, uh, three vertices um, seeing two components. Yeah. Uh, so again, we are trying to play the same game to try to find uh, a set S prime that is actually better than S, uh, that would contradict our choice of S. Yeah. 
and my uh, set as prime this time it will be actually smaller i will take s prime to be s uh sorry this is s prime with x removed yeah so i remove the vertices of x uh, from s so what happened in our in our parameters the parameters being the cardinality uh, of s versus s prime and the number of odd components um, so first of all, the size of S dropped. Yeah, it dropped by uh, by exactly X. That's uh, the, the number of vertices we removed. Uh, so what happened with the odd components? So these odd components, yeah, they may cease to be odd components because well, we removed just X from S. Yeah, so maybe they go. They were actually here somehow uh, neighboring. Maybe they all get merged into one even component. I do not care. They may stop to be to be odd components. So I have no control about those components. However, all the remaining components, they stay odd components of G minus S prime, yeah? Because they only see vertices in S prime, yeah? Because uh, these components here were defined as the neighborhood of X, right? Uh, so the, um, how, what was the drop in the number of odd components? Well, the drop was, uh, was at most the, the, the size of the neighborhood uh, in this graph H uh, of X. Yeah, so the number of odd components were neighboring uh, X. Right, um, so what is the deficit of S prime? Well, the deficit of S prime by definition is the difference between the number of odd components and the size, yeah? Uh, now we put those numbers here, yeah, and we see that uh, well, on one on one hand, in the size of s, uh, we gained uh, a plus the size of x factor, uh, uh, someone, yeah. On the other hand, on the number of component on the number of odd components, uh, we lost well at most the number of uh, the number of neighbors. However, we assume that the number of neighbors actually is strictly smaller than the size of x, and therefore we actually gained on the deficit. The deficit uh, became large, right? And this is again a contradiction because uh, S prime was supposed, to, uh, sorry, S was supposed to be a maximum size set of maximum deficit. Good, uh, any questions about that? It was again juggling with, uh, with the definition of S. Okay, if not, then maybe we can uh, gather all those, uh, all those, uh, um, um, all those uh, observations and uh, finally give the proof of, of that Birch formula. Yeah. So uh, as usual in combinatorics, we'll be doing induction on, uh, on the number of vertices of my graph. Yeah, the base case being trivial. Um, and uh, yeah, we are we are doing induction. Uh, so now we are doing induction step. Um, so because we have uh, done so much work about uh, analyzing the structure around the maximum size set of uh, maximum deficit, so let me pick the set. This is the set S, the maximum set of maximum deficit. Okay. So what do we know about this set um, so far? So if we look at all these connected components, they are all odd. And we know that after removal of any vertex, yes, in each of them, I've got a graph where the deficit is actually zero, right? So by induction hypothesis, deficit equal to zero actually means that, um, that the graph has a perfect matching, right? So now we are, uh, we are uh, using the fact that we are doing induction. So this means that for every, each of those connected components is so is a so-called factor critical graph. Yeah? So a factor critical graph is a graph where with the following property that after removal of any vertex, the graph has a perfect matching. Yeah. So and this is exactly what we proved that after removal of any vertex, we've got deficit zero, 
and induction hypothesis because this is a smaller graph gives us then a perfect match. So these are very, very particular graphs. Each of them, I could remove any vertex and I get a perfect match. Good, so this is a very strong property that we will uh, use in a moment uh, uh, to construct a matching in, in the graph. Uh, good. So this is one thing uh, that, uh, that we have already observed. The second thing that we have already observed is that we have a uh, matching that saturates uh, in this bipartite incidence graph, we've got a matching that saturates S. Yeah? So if I've got this uh, bipartite graph between, between S and the components here, contracted to single vertices, yes, then in this graph, I can find uh, a matching that matches every vertex of S. Maybe some guys are unmatched. Yeah. Okay, so we now have all the tools to actually uh, construct a matching uh, M in, uh, uh, in my graph uh, that has the largest possible size uh, being the, uh, that, uh, meaning that it leaves only the deficit of G uh, vertices unmatched. So how do we do it? So in my graph H, right, we've got this, uh, this, matching, uh, this matching M, or let's call it M0. Uh, and naturally, we can lift it uh, to, to my graph G, yeah? Because, well, uh, this was an edge between this vertex and this component, uh, and this corresponds to definitely an edge between here and some vertex in this component. Here I've got a, an edge between a vertex, uh, between this vertex and a vertex of the component that it was matched to, uh, and so on. Yeah. So I can here draw some edges from vertices of S to distant components to which they were matched in my matching M0, right? And now from the induction hypothesis, I know that each of these graphs is factor critical. It contains a, ma a perfect matching after even after removing any vertex I like. So in this components where I actually did match something, yeah, I can consider removing these vertices yeah, and argue that by induction hypothesis, there is a perfect matching here. So I can feel the perfect matching uh, inside, the, the, the matching inside each of those components so that every vertex is, is, is indeed matched. And in all the other components, well, uh, they are odd, so I need to leave at, le leave at least one vertex unmatched. But uh, I can pick it in any way and then fill it up using factor criticality to an almost perfect matching, meaning that uh, everybody is matched apart from this one vertex that is unmatched. Um, so how many uh, uh, how many vertices in total got unmatched uh, in this uh, in this uh, in this matching that we just constructed? Well, exactly those that I was uh, leaving unmatched in those uh, in those components. And how many of them there were? Well, the number of odd components here minus the size of S, which is exactly the defect of S, which is the defect of G, because uh, because I chose S to be a set of maximum. S or deficit. Good. So this was uh, so this completes the proof of Tadberg's formula because we have just uh, found a, um, a a large enough uh, matching in G. Any questions? And if you are happy with this proof, please put a plus one. Okay, I see some plus ones, but not that many. Are there any uh, things that I should uh, repeat or uh, clarify? Which observation do we get the fact that uh, we can find a perfect matching in those uh, subgraphs, in the um, components? This is induction hypothesis. Okay. Yeah. So from observation three, Yes, we know that after removal of any vertex, I've got a graph of deficit equal to zero. Okay, yeah. And this sense. is a smaller graph. And the induction hypothesis then tells you there is a perfect matching in the graph. This is a trick. Yeah. 
Good. Any more clarifications? Good. If not, then maybe we can uh, move on to the uh, to the last element of uh, of today's lecture, namely uh, Galileo advanced decomposition. Um, so this is a sort of an afterthought uh, uh, after the proof of uh, of Tadberg's formula. Uh, just to uh, say one more literature remark about Tadberg's formula. So Tadberg's formula is this uh, theorem that uh, that we have proved. Um, that tells you exactly what is the size of a maximum matching in, in, in a, a general graph. Um, you can also know this uh, uh, under the name of Tats uh, theorem. Tats theorem is usually the theorem that tells you if the deficit is, uh, is if the deficit is zero of a graph, then there is a perfect matching. Yeah, it was first proved by uh, Tat in, in this form, and then Tat, uh, I think. Uh, Berge or Tatten Berge, or in some some way they generalize it to, to give the formula uh, for the size of maximum and not necessarily perfect match. But uh, essentially, oh, this proof gives you a lot of structure, uh, a lot of insight into the structure of maximum matchings yeah. in a general graph. And uh, Galai Edmonds decomposition is some way of uh, of formalizing the structure um, via some kind of a partition of the graph into three parts. Uh, and explaining how um, how maximum matchings uh, uh, work with respect to these parts. So let's go through the through the statement uh, um, through the statement uh, um, uh, slowly. It's uh, it's a bit long because it's, it's one of those explanatory uh, uh, theorems that explain the structure of a graph and the various objects in it. Um, good. Um, so let G be a graph. Yeah, uh, let me look at uh, the following uh, animals in this graph. Let let me look at all the vertices that can be left unmatched in some maximum matching. So I'm looking at all possible maximum matchings, and I'm distinguishing uh, the um, the vertices into those that always need to be matched and that those that can be unmatched in some maximum matching. So D is the set of those vertices that can be left unmatched. Yeah? So here is the set D. It will be eventually in the statement dissolved into, into connected components and we'll be talking about um, uh, the connected components as well. Then A is simply the neighborhood of, of D. Yeah? And B is the rest of the group. So this is the Galai Edmonds decomposition. Not uh, uh, not very complicated definition, but then the uh, the theorem about the Galai Edmonds decomposition tells you how the structure of uh, of uh, how this structure relates to the structure of, of maximum matching. Um, so first point uh, in the statement, point A, yeah, is that every is that every connected component of of G of D is factor critical. So when I look at this graph, yeah, each of the each of those connected components induced by the set uh, by the set D has this strong property that after removal of any vertex, I get a perfect match. In particular, each of those connected components is odd. Yeah, uh, a factor critical graph must be odd because after the removal of any vertex, I need to be uh, to have an even number of vertices. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, one thing. Uh, the second thing. Uh, point B, yes, is that if I look at A and I look at the vertices of A and how many uh, components of D they, they see, actually I have a, a whole condition um, here satisfied, even with some slack. In the following sense, if I look at any non-empty set of vertices here, then they actually see together more components of D than their, than their number, yes? So for every non-empty set of vertices of A, they actually see together more than the size of the set connected components of G of D. Good. Um, so this is like a con um, Holtz condition plus, let's say. And the final uh, remark is about uh, how, a, how uh, uh, maximum matchings in this graph uh, can look like. 
So if M is a maximum matching in the graph, then M must look like uh, as follows. First, M must match B perfectly. So B is matched within itself, yes? Every, uh, and every vertex of B is actually matched. Uh, so in particular, there are no, um, there are no uh, um, matching edges between B and A, yeah? Uh, note that there are no uh, edges at all between B and D because A was defined as the neighborhood of D. Uh, next, when it comes to A, A must match the vertices of A to pairwise different components of G of D. Yeah, maybe there are some more components. Yeah, so it must look like that. And finally, uh, within the uh, within the, the components of G of D, yes, in each of them I have an almost perfect match. So in all of those that got matched to A, I've got a matching like that. Yes, that omits this vertex that got matched to A, but apart from this, it matches everything perfectly. And in all those components here, yes, I've got uh, I've got almost perfect matching. That, um, that leaves one vertex unmatched. So the claim is that every maximum matching in G has this, uh, has this structure. Well, this is a pretty strong statement. I mean, it, it tells you a lot about, uh, about uh, the, the structure of, uh, of perfect matching. Good, so now we, we go to the proof of this theorem uh, and the proof will revolve around uh, the same kind of ideas that we had before. Um, about uh, looking at the maximum size uh, set of maximum deficit and understanding a structure about, uh, around the set, yes? And in particular, what we want to, uh, to understand is how the set D, A, and B, um, how they look on this picture. If S is this uh, maximum size of maximum deficit, and here are the connected components uh, of G minus S, how, uh, how D, A, and B uh, look like on this picture. And so what we know already about this picture, uh, we already know that each of those connected components is factor critical. This was one of these insights in, uh, uh, in, in the proof of, uh, of that Birch formula. We argue that after removal of any vertex, I've got uh, deficit equal to zero, which by Tad's theorem or Tad Birch formula means that there is a perfect match, right? So we know that these connected components are factor critical. Uh, and second, uh, we know, this was observation, I think, four from the proof, that we already have a Hall's condition uh, satisfied between S and the components, yeah? So any subset of, uh, of vertices here sees at least as many uh, connected components as its size, yeah? Uh, but we want a bit more. We want this uh, Hall's condition with, with the slackness. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we will be going to, to analyze this. Uh, so again, this H is this bipartite adjacency graph between the... Um, the vertices of S and the components contracted to single vertices of G minus S. Yeah, so this is H. Um, and we, uh, we look at the structure in this graph. Yeah, this is a bipartite graph. Uh, we want now to understand uh, uh, a bit more about it. Okay, so let L, this is again a definition that will uh, bear with us uh, for a few minutes. Um, let me look at L here. This is in this bipartite graph, a maximum set subset of S uh, with defect equal to zero. And uh, no, that this is defect. This is this uh, uh, number that we defined in the proof of, uh, of Hall's uh, theorem. This is the size, uh, the number of neighbors of L minus the size of L, right? So this is, uh, let me write it down. Yeah, so what, what, what is actually this animal? So we know that in H, the whole condition is satisfied. So we know that this is always at least zero, right? Uh, number of neighbors is always at, at least as large as the size of the set. But now we are looking at the sets where this is tight, where that actually see exactly as many vertices as, uh, as many components as their size, yes? And we take the maximum uh, subset uh, of S with this property that is tight. Yeah? 
Okay, I did not say maximum size subset or maximal inclusion wise. It actually doesn't matter as uh, the next observation uh, tells you. I claim that actually, if I have two such subsets, L and L prime, that have tightness in host condition, that see exactly as many components as their sizes, then actually their union again has the same condition, yeah? So this means that I cannot have two different inclusion-wise maximal such subsets because their union would actually be a larger one. Yeah? So there is a unique maximum uh, L uh, that has tightness in host condition. Yeah? Uh, okay, so this observation, uh, you need to stare it for a moment and then it becomes, uh, it becomes clear. So suppose that here is uh, L and L prime, yes, which have this property that uh, they see together uh, exactly as many vertices as the size. Yeah, so this, the size of N, uh, neighborhood of L is, this, is equal to the size of L and the size of the neighborhood of, of L is equal to the size of L. Yeah. Okay, so what uh, uh, the, key, the key observation in the proof is it's in compass here and it's actually very easy. If I look at the intersection of these two, L and L prime, then the neighborhood of intersection, well, it's contained in the intersection of neighborhoods, yeah? Because, uh, well, um, if I've got a, a, a vertex here and a neighbor is both a neighbor of L and a neighbor of L prime, obviously. Um, so now on the, uh, uh, what you can do, uh, yeah. So let's estimate uh, what is the total size of the neighborhood of uh, L and L prime, yeah? Because we want to prove that it's actually um, at most the size of uh, L, uh, the L union L prime. Yeah. So uh, by simply the Morgan laws, this is uh, equal to this, the size of neighborhood of L plus the size of the neighborhood of L prime minus the, neighbor, uh, the, the size of the intersection of the neighborhoods. Now we use this inclusion uh, to see that, uh, to estimate that the intersection of the neighborhoods has at most as large cardinality as the uh, neighborhood of intersection. Of, of the intersection. Now this, yeah, the, the size of the neighborhood of L is equal to the size of L. The size of the neighborhood of L prime is equal to the size of L prime. Yeah, so, so we've got this equality here. Yeah. And in, uh, in the next inequality, we see that the size of the neighborhood of L intersection L prime is actually at least as large as the size of L intersection L prime. And this is because of host condition. Host condition in H, yeah, which we argued that uh, that holds. Yeah, so this is at most uh, this. We again use the Morgan law that uh, um, uh, that argued that this is at most the size of L uh, union L prime. However, again, by host condition in H, we know that this is upper bound by the size of the neighbor. So uh, we have this chain of inequalities and uh, starting and ending with the same thing. And therefore all of those inequalities must be, must be actually equal. You can also see this proof in the picture. Um, this is a little bit in the symbol, but in the picture, it might be more uh, apparent. If you have L and it expands to a set of the same size. And if you have L prime that expands to a set of the same size, if they both expanded to something that is strictly larger than their combined size, then the intersection would actually need to expand to something strictly smaller. And this is uh, forbidden by the fact that uh, um, that the host condition holds in H. Yeah, and this is exactly what is what is uh, what is written in symbols here. Good, so this is the proof of this observation. Yeah, so we have argued about this maximum subset of S with, uh, with tightness in host condition. Uh, good, so now we have the set L, yes, which is the maximum size with, uh, with uh, maximum uh, set with, uh, with zero defect, yes. And it sees some, um, some, some components exactly as many as its size. That's the that's the uh, that's the the thing. Uh, so I now claim that actually D must be disjoint both with S and both with those guys here. Yeah. So actually D must be, can only be contained here. 
So in other words, what I claim is that each of those vertices, each of, each of the vertices of S and each of the vertices inside here, inside those components, they need to be always matched in every perfect, in every maximum matching of, of G. So why so? How a, how a maximum matching in G looks like? Well, uh, we argued in the proof of that first formula that this, uh, that this maximum matching, it needs to match S perfectly. Yes. Yes, it needs to match the vertices of S to different components of, uh, of G minus S. Yes. And then in some of the components here that were left over because of this deficit uh, being positive, maybe there, 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 there must have been some vertices unmatched. Yes. And apart from this, yes, there must have been perfect matchings inside here. So this is how a perfect matching must, uh, a maximum matching must look like according to our proof of, uh, of uh, Tadberg's formula, because well, uh, that's the only way we leave only the defect, uh, the, the deficit number of vertices unmatched. Yeah. So obviously then the vertices of S need to be matched in order to meet this, this shape, yes? And also the vertices of L, because there is exactly as many components here, uh, as the size of L that is in uh, that are adjacent to them, they need to be matched to those those components, yes. And then I need to feel perfect matchings, almost perfect matchings using factor criticality uh, inside them. So in particular, all those vertices they will always be perfectly matched, right? The only vertices that can be left unmatched theoretically are the vertices that are living here in those components that are not neighboring to L. Good. And I claim that this is exactly it, that exactly the vertices here are the vertices of D, that each of these vertices can be left unmatched in some, uh, in some, uh, in some maximum matching of, of the graph. Um, right. So how to prove it? Well, let's, let's start. Maybe I will uh, remove uh, the features so far on the picture. Yeah. So here are the, the components. Yeah. So let's uh, pick any vertex here. Yes, vertex Q. I would like now to uh, create a, um, a maximum matching that leaves this vertex unmatched uh, because this is needed for arguing uh, that uh, uh, that this vertex is in D, yeah? So this vertex can be left unmatched. So how do I do it? So now I need to create a, a, a maximum matching that, uh, that uh, leaves it unmatched. So first of all, yes, how, how did the uh, maximum matchings uh, uh, were constructed? Well, we started with constructing a matching between S, yes, and the components, and then we were feeling this matching uh, with, uh, with, with almost perfect matchings within the components um, done by, uh, by a factor of criticality. So first of all, uh, let me observe that in my bipartite incidence graph, there is a matching between S and the components that actually does not match this component C, this component C that contains the vertex U. Yeah, uh, sorry for this mess. Yeah, so again, I claim that I can find a matching between the vertices of S and the components that actually omits this component that has the vertex U. So why so? Well, um, to prove that this, is, uh, that this, uh, this can be done, it, uh, we only need to make sure that uh, the whole condition is still satisfied after removal of this component C, after removal of the, po of the possibility of, uh, of making a matching with, uh, of, of, of using um, the component C as a match, yeah? But look, let's look at the defects in this graph H, yeah? Uh, this was the maximum set of defect zero. So all these sets that have anything outside of this set L, yes, they have actually positive defects. Yeah? And removal of this component C could have decreased 
the defect only of those components. Yeah, that uh, sorry, uh, that have negative. Uh, uh, they have negative defect. They see more uh, than uh, their size. Yeah, so uh, removal of this component C actually could have increased the defect only of those that are still negative. Yeah, so I will by removing of uh, uh, by removal of of the component C, I will not make any defect positive. Yeah? So this means that after removal of C from this bipartite incidence graph, I still have the whole condition satisfied. So I can find this perfect match. Uh, sorry, sorry this, this, this matching that saturates the, uh, uh, the side S. Yeah? And now, uh, once we omitted uh, the component C, this becomes, uh, this becomes clear. So we have this, uh, this matching M0, yes. I can uh, sort of understand it in, in the graph G by uh, lifting it to into the graph G. And then I can just feel using factor criticality within the components. And in order to avoid uh, using U in, uh, in, in a maximum matching, I can just avoid it inside this component and it will not be matched because uh, it did not participate in, in the matching of S, right? So yes, we indeed uh, uh, proved now our observation. Yeah, that D consists of all the remaining birds. Yeah, so this is D. Good, so the conclusion is, uh, is as follows. D consists of all the, of all the components of G minus S that do not neighbor this maximum size of defect zero. Yeah. Now you can easily see that a the uh, the neighbors uh, a the, the neighborhood of those components exactly corresponds uh, exactly is here. This is a equal to s minus l. Why so? Because every vertex here must have uh, at least one neighbor uh, in D because otherwise it could have we could have added it to L, uh, increasing the, the size of defect zero, the size of a set of defect zero. Actually, we would get a, a set of, 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 of positive defect there. Um, good, so this is A, yeah? And now B is the rest of the graph. So B is just the set L plus all the components that neighbor L. So now it remains to uh, to check uh, the conditions that we that we promised. Yeah, uh, every connected component of G G of D is factor critical. Well, this this was the, um, based on our understanding of of the structure around the set S. Yeah, so this is this this is easy. Um, now this uh, this uh, this better holds condition that every non-empty subset here X actually sees more components um, uh, than its size. Um, yeah, and this is, uh, this is true because it, if it had seen only as many components as its size, and we know that it is at least as many because, uh, because the, of the whole condition in H, uh, if it sees uh, only as many uh, connected components as its size, then we could add it to L and increase the, the maximum size and the maximum set of uh, of of of, uh, um, of zero defect. Yeah. So this the the stronger holes condition uh, follows from uh, from the maximality of L. Yeah. And finally, um, the structure of the maximum matchings in in the graph is is sort of apparent from from our proof uh, of Tadberg formula uh, and and our. Uh, analysis that we had before. So if I have a maximum matching in G, it must look like that, that L is being matched uh, to those components that neighbor L. And here I've got a perfect matching. So indeed B is matched to itself perfectly. Then A, these guys must be matched to different connected components uh, of D. Yes, in order to, to have maximality. And then in every connected component of D, I need to have an almost perfect matching, uh, uh, leaving one vertex that is either matched to S or left unmatched. And this concludes uh, the proof of, uh, of Galite's theory. Uh, sorry, of uh, uh, Galite's at once uh, decomposition. 
Good. Uh, so uh, this is uh, essentially what I wanted to uh, to say during this lecture. Um, this knowledge is sort of a fundamental. It's not very often used, but I think that uh, that it's worth to know uh, how structure in of of, of uh, maximum matchings in in general graphs uh, works. Uh, sometimes it, it it can be used. Um, so this is uh, uh, this for today. Uh, the next week it will be uh, Martin uh, continuing uh, with, with another topic. We will start graph miners theory. Uh, so it will be the definition of tree width, basic uh, things about tree width, and uh, then further on to to grid uh, grid minor theorem and so on. Good. Are there any questions about this proof or about anything else? Sorry, I, I just. Uh... Um, uh, okay, uh, j just a question about the definition of D in the mm -hmm. um, Kalai Edmonds decomposition. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, could you repeat the definition of D? Just, just I, I just want to make sure that I. The definition of D is as follows Let's look at um, all possible maximum matchings in the graph. And let's look at, uh, at those vertices that can be left unmatched in some maximum match. Yeah. Okay. So, so, I, so a vertex is in D if I can find a maximum matching that actually leaves it unmatched. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because I was, um, I ju just wanted to make sure that it's not like a, uh, a set of vertices that uh, are unmatched in some matching. No. Like, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not a particular one. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not that uh, they need to be yeah. unmatched in every maximum matching. They they can be unmatched. In okay. Some. Yeah, but in others yeah, they can be matched. Yeah. So essentially, okay. this tells you that uh, maximum matchings uh, uh, they behave like uh, you can choose a maximum matching by choosing what happens on B, choosing how A is matched to the connected components, and then choosing within each connected component of D how uh, you you fill it up using factor typically. And this three stages process uh, um, uh, achieves every possible maximum matching in a graph. Okay, I see. Yeah. Um, thanks.